Hello and welcome back to my channel, Deku Fanfic. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the final part of our series, What If Deku Reacted to MHA? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Alpha6321 from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Okay, everything's prepared. Who's ready to see All Might beat the shit out of his two biggest fans? I described the upcoming scenes in the best and worst way possible. I didn't hurt them that badly. Yagi tried to defend himself. He nearly broke Izuku's spine. I dug him in deeper. He what? And Ko's omnipotence activated upon hearing this. Yaga's face went so pale that he might as well turn into a calcium-based life form at this point. Somebody's in the doghouse. Wait, are we just going to watch those two? What about the rest of Class A's fights? A confused Shizaki asked, trying to ignore the fact that the number one hero was being glared to death by an irate mother. The gods have spoken and they want to see this happen as soon as possible. Sorry to say but you kids have been relegated to the off-screen beatdown section. Truly, few fates were worse than this. The side characters were used to this but those with reputations to their names couldn't help but gasp. Yes yes, woe is me and all that. If it makes you feel better I'll let put up some epic battle music for you guys. Nothing better than watching a curb stomp while listening to some badass music. Play Hiroyuki Sawano and Pure King. Oh shit that's good. With the gyro seal of approval we unpause the scene with All Might staring down his two students. You'll have to work together to beat me. So come at me you too. The teachers proceeded to explain the exercise. A simple 2v1 scenario where the students needed to either win their fight outright, cuff their opponent for victory, or run away to get help. A fair enough exercise, though I have my misgiving about running away from your enemy. Rarely if ever will there be a time where your opponent is just powerful enough to beat you but weak enough to let you run away successfully. Plus there's the civilian problem. Asobai spoke up. If the heroes ran away who would be left to help? Sometimes there's no right answer. Fair enough. Aizawa begrudgingly agreed. Sometimes when shit hit the fan there's nothing a hero can really do other than run damage control. It takes self-sacrifice and a certain degree of near-suicidal heroism. Something he hates to admit that his problem children had in spades. Well this was the first time we did something like this. The test is subject to change. Nezu agreed, it was a pretty rough design, to begin with. More for a trial run for future tests really. Besides, if someone like All Might ever turned villain would we really have any hope of beating him or running away at all? Kaminari half-joked, paling at the thought of a villain All Might. There are ways. X4 Sobai, Izuku, Momo, and Nezu spoke at once, scaring the shit out of everyone else and making All Might sweat slightly. All for one could fuck off he'd rather fight him again than go up against these four geniuses. Can we get back to the fight? We're wasting valuable music on all this commentary. Fair enough, the music lover had a point. The world's most awkward bus ride later. Now, this is where we will fight. All Might announced, pulling out some kind of metal device while his successor began to panic. Fight. You can't expect us to beat you right. That would be impossible like this. At least not without an hour or so of prep time. If he had Momo around he could cut that time to a few minutes but still. Pessimistic and impatient I see. Worry not, us teachers have taken precautions to make this test a bit fairer. These nifty weights made by our very own Mayhatsum hold us down by a whole half of our body weight each. All Might said happily as if that meant much. My babies. Hatsum couldn't help but coo over her inventions getting a chance to shine in the finals. Though seriously did you guys think those things would actually mean much with someone like All Might? Dude can punch mountains out of existence. A mere 675 kilos of weight isn't going to do much. It was the equivalent of giving Goku weighted training gear. At this point you'd need material made of sewn together singularities just to phase the bastard. Look if you want to come up with a way to handicap Japanese Goku here then feel free. Aizawa, who I had a feeling came up with the test spoke up. Poor guy. This is the second test he made that's been deconstructed in front of his eyes. Drug him. Fuck why didn't they think of that? It's not like All Might was immune to poisons, or disease, or drugs, or radiation. He was just a giant wall of muscle with all of the classic weaknesses that came with. Tisk, trying to bring the teachers down to our level. How insulting. The delusional bastard named Bekugo said, causing All Might to smirk menacingly while giving the audience the sans treatment. We'll see. A cartoonishly villainous laugh escaped his lips as he said this. Ah, explains the song choice, Gyro muttered. And pure king indeed. The two problem children had opposite approaches to the oncoming fight. Izuku wanting to avoid conflict at all costs while Bekugo wanted to fight All Might head on somehow knowing that he'd tire out eventually. Tisk, the young Bakugo. His perception is terrifying at times. Though he underestimates me if he thinks it will take more than an hour for me to beat those two, even with the restraints. Yagi thought to himself, it was impressive that he noticed but also unwise for him to bank on something so uncertain. How does he know? And it's not like I can admit that he's right, besides. Izuku thought, imagining fighting all might. There were no scenarios where that ended well for them. Losing all patience Bakugo turned to smack Izuku with the back of his gauntlet, sending him to the ground. 
How did he not at least get detention for that? Shizaki raised a good question which no one was able to answer. Meanwhile, Nko was having a minor panic attack over the whole situation. Stop talking, you think you're all that. Well, it's pissing me off. Izuku tried to appeal to reason again by saying they had no chance but Bakugo was having none of it. You think I need your power to pass? Well, forget it. Once again, the conversation devolved into a fit of yelling. Or at least it would have if it weren't for the mini hurricane that swept through the fake city at that moment, ripping apart buildings, the street, and any vehicles in one general direction. A camera panned to a smiling All Might with a fist held out. Now, get ready to have a really bad time. I rest my case, as so I said while motioning to the utter destruction created by a simple punch. Weaken my ass. Who cares about collateral damage? Think of this as just another test and you'll have a bad time, newbies. I'm a villain, so give me your best shot. All Might's intimidation factor increased by a factor of. There was no real number for this he was completely different now. Knowing that they had absolutely no chance to win Izuku elected to get the hell out of there. Bakugo had other ideas, which included blinding All Might temporarily. Charging in for a right hook. And immediately getting his face grabbed midair. At that moment a caption appeared on the screen saying, This risk was calculated. But man am I bad at math. Sorry I had to, it was just too perfect. Asobi apologized before the seriousness of the situation came back. Awas Eshpiktin dis. A muffled Bakugo said before unloading dozens of small blasts on All Might face. As if it would really do much. This kid has a one-track mind. Too bad a hero never goes far without being flexible. All Might thought before slamming Bakugo into the ground, silencing the tiny pops. Nice firecracker kid but you'll need a bit more than that to hurt me. Now then, he sets his attention on Izuku, effectively teleporting behind him, bleach style. Planning on leaving your partner behind while you make a break for it. His intimidation act reminded Izuku of Stain for a moment, causing him to turn on full cowling and instinctively jump back. Oh, isn't that unfortunate? All Might said to himself as Izuku collided with Bakugo who was in the middle of charging in again. Their complete opposites, their fighting styles, fight philosophies, tactics. None of them meshed together at all. Tamaki spoke up for once, listing off just how screwed these two were. Those weaknesses would have been detrimental against any opponent. But against All Might. Yeah, no this wasn't going to end well. Like I said, fighting him head-on is impossible. Izuku tried once again, banging his head on the proverbial wall. Shut up. I win. That's what heroes do. Was Bakugo's retort, bringing up memories from their past. Fine, sure. But fighting here isn't Izuku tried again, hoping for a compromise but he was too late to notice All Might falling from the skies with a guardrail of all things. Said guardrail slammed Izuku into the ground and kept him there for a bit. Would a villain really give those two so much time to talk things out? Momo asked, not believing that such long conversations could happen mid-combat. You'd be surprised. Every hero plus Izuku, Todoroki and Asobi said at once. Villains were surprisingly polite that way. Or stupid, probably both. Immediately afterward Bakugo found a fist in his stomach, making him throw up and sending him flying by nearly a hundred feet. You're worked up about young Midoriya's growth right. I get that but remember if he starts at level 1 while you were at 50 of course you'd grow at different rates. That doesn't mean that you have no room left to grow. Don't throw it all away. Though it's not a matter of power for you. All Might tried to play the therapist. And granted he got it mostly right, though he missed a few things. That's right. You're a nasty guy, but no matter what you always try to win. That's why I looked up to you. Izuku thought to himself, struggling to lift the guard rail off of him. Zip it All Might. If you're saying I got to rely on his help. Then I'd rather lose. That Kugo spat out, thoroughly pissing off Izuku who activates full cowling. That's so. As long as you have no regrets. All Might said, cocking back a fist to end the fight. You jerk. Izuku yelled as he punched Bakugo across the face, sending him a few feet away from All Might while leaving him shocked speechless. You'd rather lose. That doesn't sound like you at all. Izuku yelled before grabbing Bakugo and running off. It was at this point that they realized neither of their plans was going to work. You couldn't run away from such a superior opponent. His speed was simply too great. They couldn't fight him either, they'd lose, simple as that. But there was a compromise that could work. Hit and run tactics. Float like a moth, sting like a fucking wasp. How lame but it's all we got damn it. Pretty much summed up their strategy. Meanwhile, we'll all might having a casual stroll across the ruined city. Were you even trying in that fight? With your speed you could probably search the whole city in a matter of minutes right. David deadpan at his friend's casual take on the test. I was tired. Can't you give an old man a break? We're the same age Toshi. All this talking is wasting so much time. The music's already run out. Gyro complained as the badass Ost ran its course. Fear not, for I am here, with endless music from across time and space. That's your cue to play stupid DVD player. Asobi said, kicking a random part of the wall that apparently had a DVD player in it. Play Bleach Ost number one's one else by Shiro Sajisu there we go. Bakugo burst through an alley, pointing his gauntlet towards All Might while making a face that just screamed dying inside letting out a few minor bursts as a distraction he got out of the way so that Izuku could do his part. Said green-themed hero had a very familiar gauntlet on his own arm. I'm sorry All Might. He yelled before nuking his teacher at point-blank range, nearly dislocating his shoulder from the pushback. W wow. 
This is what Kekin uses all the time. The compromise between fighting and running away. Not bad for improvisation. They even manage to keep the collateral damage to a minimum. However, Sensei still gotta do his best. All Might once again scared the shit out of the audience through sheer determination. Back to the two running hero wannabes. Come on, we're almost at the gate. I don't know why it looks so cute but if just one of us makes it we win. Izuku exclaimed, meanwhile Bakugo was looking around, noticing that everything was still blown apart. Meaning All Might sent that punch from all the way back here. Well shit, more than one person thought at the same time, remembering just how strong their number one was. Izuku was making empty remarks, hoping that their last blast knocked All Might out. As if a wimp like you could take him down. If he comes at us again he'll get a taste of my gauntlet. Bakugo boasted, not for long though. Yes yes, let's see it then. All Might said, appearing right between the two. Bakugo with his usual fast reactions tried to blast him only to have his gauntlet completely destroyed by a single punch. Why so shocked? This isn't even my full speed, given the weights. No, die hero scum. Seconds later an announcement went off, saying that the first team to pass was the one going against Aizawa. As this was said All Might could be seen holding down Bakugo under his foot while carrying Izuku by his arm. Hoping to hit me with your strongest attack in order to make a break for the gate. It was a good attempt but now that the dust has settled, it's over. All Might said, not noticing the firecracker pops underneath him. Cram it. Was the only warning he got before Bakugo sent up a particularly strong burst. All Might was sent into the sky while Bakugo and Izuku stood back up. I hate to admit it but this is our only shot at winning this. Bakugo muttered while picking up Izuku, swinging him over his shoulders. Kakin what are yo die? And just like that Bakugo sent Izuku flying via an explosion assisted throw. Ugh, that hurt. But this is good, All Might is airborne and I still have a few seconds before he lands. I can make it. However Izuku made one fatal mistake. He let himself have hope. That's sadly true. New Hampshire. Smash. Too naive my little heroes. All Might punched the air in front of him, launching him back right into Izuku's spine, nearly breaking it. While Izuku was being sent flying and skipping across the street Bakugo made his move. Those gauntlets let me go full power with no risk. That was stupid of me. He held out his hands, preparing another huge blast. We had no hope of beating you without taking a few risks. And once again, All Might was sent flying back from Bakugo's huge explosion. Get the hell out of here Deku. I can handle him better than you and your half-assed improvisations. So make yourself useful for once. Bakugo yelled, preparing for All Might's inevitable comeback. Damn, the gate is close, one and a half leaps should be enough. Just run, and you'll win. It's what Kakin would do. Boom. Izuku looked back to see Bakugo slammed into the ground once again. This time however the hold was much tighter. Sorry young Bakugo, but that kind of self-destructive attack is way too traumatic for your teachers to watch. Bakugo however wasn't giving up. He grabbed onto All Might's arm, giving him a few more pops and biting his hand in defiance. You damn nerd. Though already, Bakugo barked out. Even if it messes me up, I chose this path to victory. I refuse to admit that even this isn't enough. Seeing this level of determination Izuku knew what he needed to do. Activating full cowling he stood up and ran. But not towards the gate. All Might looks up in shock at what Izuku just did. This was all he could do before he got a punch to the face from his successor, sending him back and causing him a coughing fit. Out of my way, All Might. Izuku said with a smile as he finished his attack, picking up an unconscious Bakugo along the way before rushing past the gate, passing his exam. So, any complaints about only showing this fight? Also, how was the music? I'm thinking of making that a regular thing for fights like this. The Sobai asked, there seemed to be no complaints at this point. Pretty much everyone agreed that this fight was already badass enough to start with, not to mention quite long. As for the music, can you share your playlist after all this is over? Gyro asked me, I'll take that as a good sign. Sure, no problem. If it's just music then I can leave my full library for you guys to enjoy. Speaking of enjoyment we'll be having a special guest soon, it's his birthday Tota actually it was more like 4 days ago but you know. Time dilation nonsense and he's coming here since he wanted to meet you guys. Another version of Izuku is with him too so that's you. A knocking came at the door. Ugh, that must be them. Walking up to the door Asobai was about to open and only for it to burst open with a foot sticking out from the entrance. What's up my lip glops? It's party time and who better to have it with than the party god himself. Yo Deku, do the thing. An absolute mad lad with a relatively strange design stepped through the door with another Izuku following along. This one held a microphone in his hands. Wait shit was that the song we heard last time? Gyro questioned, finally recognizing what the familiar voice that sung last chapter sounded like. Deku inhales and, as Deku breathed in for the long haul Asobai rapidly teleported across the room, quickly preparing all the equipment needed to support the massive undertaking that was about to take place, including all of the best audio gear the multiverse had to offer of course, and an animation featuring none other than our Izuku synced to the beat of the song. Meanwhile our guest Kato was shaking in absolute glee at the impromptu concert that was about to go down. The looks on their faces are going to be priceless, though I feel like I've forgotten something. Eh, hey, can't be that important. The new god thought to himself, too busy hyping himself up to think about what it was, which was the fact just moments ago his home realm's power source blew up freezing time in his realm. 
and he should really fix it too. Now I remember. Party gifts. The young god remembered what he forgot. Just not the most important thing he forgot. Or maybe it was. Who could really tell with these shonen protagonist types? Play. Plus ultra. Fab LFTRUSTAGE and divide music. You don't know what it's like to be worthless. Quirkless. Nobody looking beyond what is shown on the surface. Word is it was devastating for anybody who heard this. I was never broken if I made it then I earned this. At this point the watchers were getting swept up into the beat. The only thing stopping them from responding verbally was the sheer shock value of Izuku singing in the first place. The lyrics so far didn't help with how it pretty much summed up his origin story. Earnest. Light up like a furnace. Inherit abilities of my utility. Bit of me was feeling nervous. Turn this curse into a blessing. Progressing, letting the best of my lessons shape up my future and its purpose. The hype was building, the beat was slowly but surely rising as the song went on. All Might, in particular, was giving his full attention to the song, the lyrics so far hitting him the hardest with Inko following not far behind. Bakugo was completely and utterly silent, accepting the challenge in Izuku's voice. The Baka squad on the other hand was seconds away from bursting into cheers. Mina and Kirishima were already bouncing to the beat while Kaminari and Siro were halfway there as far as hype went. Then we had the Deka squad the leader of which was seconds away from passing out from his own song as his face did its best to resemble Kirishima's hair. Ada was trying his best to keep Izuku upright while staring at the new Deku's performance, internally happy with his friend's alternate self. Achako was red-faced and listening with rapt attention as Deku sang his heart out, instantly noticing that he was periodically meeting her eyes throughout the song. Suyu noticed this and tried to keep Achako conscious similar to what Ada was doing but she couldn't help but be distracted by the song. Thankfully Melissa was there to pick up the slack while they both enjoyed. Finally, there was Todoroki, stoic as always but with a nearly imperceptible smile on his face as he listened on. His own mini Tata squad following his example as Momo, Kayoka, and Shoji listen on. Though Kayoka was trying her best to keep up with the lyrics herself. Take another step and I'm better than anybody. I'm battering never sorry. You're maddening and I'm worried. You do this for glory. Look back at my story I'm a different tier different category. I can be taking it up to a hundred. Hit another blow I bring the thunder. Presence will fill you wonder. That I'll be taking you under. Cheering and singing started filling the room as the watchers got into the groove of the song. Though most couldn't quite keep up with this level of speed they sure tried their best. Those who knew better just stuck to cheering Deku on as the song continued. Momo in particular went the extra mile and helped me out by making confetti poppers and some smoke machines. See this is why your best girl. Take on villains not kidding can do it all night. And when the limit's a million I feel like all might. Kick it to the curb and every word I spit is vital. People never learn it when I'm telling them my title. Revival I'll come and wreck you. Call me a loser more like a Deku. Damn straight. Kirishima, Siro, Kaminari, and surprisingly Bakugo yelled out in unison. Though obviously for different reasons. It didn't help that Deku was alternating his stares to both Bakugo and Achako as he sang this part, challenging and thanking them for the name respectively. I don't want to fall under. But I've always been scared. Got no time left to wonder. Now it's time to prepare. I took a step. Now I'm facing the unknown. Got no regret. I won't face this on my own. Not the one they want me to be. But I'll make it through and they'll see. I'll find a way plus ultra. Never done I won't see defeat. One for all I'm finally free. I'll find a way. Plus ultra. With the small pause in the music those singing along took this as their cue to breathe and promised to themselves that they wouldn't try that again. To everyone's surprise and amusement Deku just smirked at them and took his own breath before continuing. Kayoka couldn't help but smirk alongside him as she was one of the few that could keep up with his fast-paced rapping. You've got a mask. Covering half. You're hardly a villain. I did the math. Zeroed the path. I'm touching the ceiling. Gotta make it fast. City's collapsed. No time to be killing. Wanna take it back. Heroes just act. Be one in a million, yay. At this point the pro heroes couldn't help but join in. Shigaraki's roast was too much of an opportunity to waste as they laughed and cheered amongst themselves. Well, most of them did. Present Mike was matching Deku word for word while Aizawa just smirked and sat back, secretly enjoying himself, though he'd never admit it when asked. Dave and All Might were standing side by side in appreciation of Deku's talent while also casting looks at the blushing Melissa along with the rest of the girls with a resigned look on their faces. If their own Izuku had this much talent then the results were rather obvious. Though they weren't angry about it in the slightest. Inko was feeling nothing but pride at her new son's talent and the way others were reacting to it. Though she could do without midnight teasing and corrupting the other girls as the song went on. On second thought, more grandkids. She joined in on the teasing. The big three were pretty much mimicking their teachers. Mirio was staring at his new self-proclaimed rival with a smile while Tamaki shyly smiled in the background while enjoying the music. And Nejire was joining in on the teasing with Midnight and Inko. What are the odds? Finally there was Class B Tetsu Tetsu, in particular, was putting a new meaning to the face headbanging as he and his twin used each other's skulls as a target. The others seeing this decided to stay as far away from the two bulls as possible while still enjoying the song. As for the 1B girls the results were pretty varied. 
with the translation pill from earlier Pony was able to keep up rather well and enjoyed herself a bit too much, nearly joining in with the two charging bulls before being pulled back by the one sand of her class. Said older sister was enjoying every moment of the concert, it's been a while since she could just sit back and relax like this and she didn't even have to wait for the cultural festival. Ibarra and Yui were watching on silently, enjoying the music passively compared to their classmates and teachers, though it was obvious that neither of them was experienced in these sorts of things. Finally, there was Kanoko who was completely awestruck at this Izuku's singing skills. Her own dream of being an idol showing through as she took notes from the clearly talented otherworldly schoolmate of hers. Sharp mentally, arch enemies fast, dark weaponry, quirk destined to last, class chemistry, two timing the task, our legacy, won't be turned to ash, all for one, give 5% and it's done. I've never been one to run. Stay making your rock a sea. Loud smack. Achako, her future mother, and our Izuku passed out in unison. The more sensitive of the girls nearly followed sweet but managed to remain conscious. Meanwhile, the flirty ones were having the time of their lives as their teasing fantasies came true. Not the one they ever mentioned but I told ya. That I'll be number one. Yeah, push it plus ultra. I don't want to fall under. But I've always been scared. Got no time left to wonder. Now it's time to prepare. I took a step. Now I'm facing the unknown. Got no regret. I won't face this on my own. Not the one they want me to be. But I'll make it through and they'll see. I'll find a way. Plus ultra. Never done I won't see defeat. One for all I'm finally free. I'll find a way. Plus ultra. Not the one they want me to be. But I'll make it through and they'll see. I'll find a way. Plus ultra. Never done I won't see defeat. One for all I'm finally free. I'll find a way plus ultra. Stunned silence reigned for a few seconds before the room filled with uproarious applause. Holy shit dude. That was awesome. Where did you learn to rap like that? And who wrote that song it was totally wicked. Kaminari was the first to approach Deku, almost acting like he was a celebrity in his one right. Which wasn't actually wrong. Kaminari-san, it's good to see you, and thanks for the praise. Kayoka-san actually wrote this song while the music was made by myself. And my singing. Well in my world I created my own YouTube channel before I got into UA. At first it was just my regular hero analysis stuff but later on I got roped into making a music video with Kayoka-san and the rest is history. He explained sheepishly, who knew that all it would take for him to get his name on the Heroics leaderboard was a popular YouTube channel. Momo, Kayoka, and surprisingly Nejire were taking notes on that. Seriously why didn't they think of this before? Popularity was a huge part of being a pro hero. Getting some early exposure through the internet would be an invaluable experience. Now I'm sure you guys are all wondering who exactly this is, as Sobai said while waving to Kato who just stood and waved at the thoroughly amused bunch in front of him, knowing full well that part of that amusement came from his own design. He was just as tall as a Sobai, so completely average in that regard along with his regular brown hair, though his aesthetic seemed to be the exact opposite. While a Sobai tended to fade into the background, for the most part, this god took every measure to visually stand out. He wore a full suit, the outside of which was royal blue while the interior was sky blue. His inner shirt was a grass green color while his tie contrasted nicely with the rest with its pure black color. And that was without going into his heterochromic blue and green eyes and mixed matched sunglasses that he wore on top of his head. All in all he exuded hyperactive energy while maintaining a semi-serious appearance. Over his shoulder was burned clothes, evidence of a fight, but not had bothered to question it for now. This brat right here is the god of animation in my direct kuai. It's his birthier this millennium so we decided to celebrate it with you guys. Now be nice, he's only a few million years old and he tends to smash the things he doesn't like. I lightly roast my fellow deity while said god's face slowly became angrier and angrier. Oi, stop talking about me like I'm some kinda little kid. Just because I'm a new god doesn't mean I'm some babbling baby. He isn't wrong about my smashing tendencies though. He said, looking directly at Minda at the very end. Heard you loud and clear, walking away. Minda accepted his fate and stood directly behind Izuku for protection. Giving a thumbs up Kato calmed down and turned towards his Deku. So, I think I speak for everyone when I say that we want an encore. Let's hear it people. Encore. Encore. His voice got higher and deeper, pushing in a bit of Conqueror's hacky to get his point across as the others joined in from a combination of shared hype and light fear due to the god's presence. Aw oh, geez, how can I say no with that kind of reception? But for this song why don't we bring in our hosts along with a certain number one hero. Deku agreed before roping in a Sobai, Kato, and All Might into his next song who looked stone-faced, excited, and confused, terrified respectively. St Yagi kun take this, it's an instant singing skill and some booze, trust me you'll need it, and don't worry too much, you only need to sing a single part and it isn't that long. Just enjoy yourself. A Sobai whispered to the scared hero while slipping him a drink. Holding it for a second All Might contemplated the morality of juicing up before a song before saying screw it and taking a page from a Sobai's book. He chugged the shot down, turned on his muscle mode, and joined in as the music built up. Play, English dub One Punch Man the Hero. Full ver. Sam Luff Studio Iraqi. One punch. Three, two, one, kill shot. He's here. Triumph. The strongest one. Watch a saying. Frustration. No one can stop me now. One punch. It's done. Again, he's won. Shouted aloud. Winning it every time. 
Power, get your power, surpass the limits of the human race. Even after such a short amount of time this song's hype built up much quicker than the last. Nearly everyone was getting into it and even Bakugo started jamming along, this song reminding him more of All Might than Deku which he could get behind. Hiroshima and Tetsu Tetsu however were steps away from a manliness-induced coma as they watched the epic music video that went alongside it, showing such epic figures as Son Goku, Monkey D. Luffy, and Saitama indulging in varying degrees of badassery. Hero, I don't do this for praising or reward. Don't applaud with your big standing ovation. Hero, in secret, I'm always fighting evil so no one knows. My foes are closing in and covering the sky. I will not ignore them, cause if I'm a hero, then I am prepared to face them all till the day I die. So I'll unleash my fist. 3, 2, 1, fight back. He's here. Go on. Fight fair, don't run. What has happened? Everything's numb. My enemies are gone. Justice. Enforced. With no retort. Cut it all off. Cut off the vial. Say your prayers. Power. Get your power. Adrenaline is overflowing everywhere. Power. Get your power. Strike them all down with the techniques that I have trained. By this point everyone was able to sing along. For the most part, the pacing of this song was a bit more reserved than the last so most could keep up. The fact that the lyrics could apply to many of them helped to boost up the hype as the heroes in training rocked out to what they now agreed to be their collective theme song. Hero, the strongest guys the world will ever know. Each began all their journeys oh so tiny. Hero, I suffered to overcome my weakness and get so strong. I raise my fists up with the gods that dwell within point them out and always pushing forward. Hero, I will be until I taste the dirt of defeat someday. The very best hero. By this point Izuku was crying tears of joy once again seeing his mentor, another version of himself, and two literal gods sing a song that reminded him so much of his own journey and what was to come. Hearing this he couldn't help but feel hope build up for the future. I will fight on and never give up. I picture the future I want in my heart. I wake up, go out into the world. Now, soaring up high, feeling strong, undeterred. No matter the time, no matter the place, simultaneous. I will not give up. Picture the future. Out into the world. Strong and undeterred. Ooh, ooh. Hero. I don't do this for praising or reward. Don't applaud with your big standing ovation. Hero. In secret, I'm always fighting evil so no one knows. I raise my fists up with the gods that dwell within point them out and always pushing forward. Hero. I will be until I taste the dirt of defeat someday. The very best hero. The loneliest hero. Uh, 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 uh. I want to be the strongest hero. When the song ends, Kado fires Kai Blast into the sky, creating small fireworks that filled the room with beautiful lights. While Asobai was thankful to have made sure the roof was nowhere near Kado's firing range, or else everyone would be crushed by the building collapsing on itself into a burning pile of slag. Not that it would matter since everyone in this room was effectively immortal, but still, he didn't want to waste time rebuilding before showing the next episode. Still an insane bastard, a Kuai. The anime god turns to Asobai and smirks, insanity is relative, Asobai kun. It depends on who has whom locked in the cage, and right now I'm not in a cage, Kato says before giving him a smug look, I bet you're still jealous that I have more powers than you. Bitch please, just because I don't use half my powers doesn't mean they aren't there. Besides, I don't even need them to kick your ass monkey boy. Asobai shot back with equal smugness on his face. What did you say, clone freak? Kato got up into Asobai's face, animated lightning coursing between the two deities' eyes as the argument heated up. A blazing crimson aura surrounding Kato while distortions in the world appeared around Asobai's body. You heard what I said, Dobe. Asobai pulled out the classic Sasuke insult, pissing Kato off while he prepared to pull a Batman, Deadpool at any moment. The two glared at each other with such intensity that rivals that made Stain's killing intent seem positively tame. Just before everyone else collapsed due to the two's deadly aura, it disappeared completely as the two deities share a bro hug. Good to see you haven't gone soft to damn team. Kato exclaimed, no real beef meant. Besides, he knew better than to piss off the guy whose bread and butter was fucking with people stronger than himself. And good to see that you know not to rely entirely on your raw power monkey boy. Raw power and techniques can only take you so far against an opponent with billions of years of experience over you. Asobai laughed it off, reminding his kuhai not to bite off more than he could chew. Though it would be a tough one for him to pull off, the realm of animation was a vast one after all. At least I actually train for power. You barely train at all, spending all your time in a lab like some Tony Stark wannabe. I mean at least train Chakra or Haki dammit, I know you know how to use them. Tesk, this again. No thanks. Those powers are nothing but a crutch, I've survived just fine using nothing but my mind. The body is nothing more than a meat suit for me so using powers that rely on physicality is pointless. If I wanted a stronger body I'd just build one. Asobai tried to explain once again. To prove his point he disintegrated his current body and a new one came from one of the doors to the room. The moment he entered the new body let out a huge burst of conqueror's hacky that caught the new god off guard, sending him to his knees momentarily. P point taken, fair enough. Seeing that he didn't have much left to do here Kato decided to say his farewells to the watchers. Apologies for the flexing but sometimes you just gotta let loose right. Hope to see you guys next millennia if you manage to reincarnate. He exclaimed before leaving, taking Deku along with him. 
Before any of them could register that he had left, a garganta appears behind Takoyami and a half-hollow masked Kato peeks through the distortion in space-time. You know what I forgot. It's time for me to use a Pokémon move. Here's a gift for all you cute mortals. Kato yeeted a small arsenal of presents into the room, each landing in front of everyone but a Sobai, and inside was a mug that was personalized for each person. Though two certain hard boys got silver water bottles that said on it that could have killed me if I wasn't me instead. And before I forget, I TS time TO upgrade THE chicken OF darkness. He screeched out after putting on his hollow mask, the Vizard voice modulator in full blast. A long rusty blade stabs into Takoyami from behind, the sword sticking out of his chest as it oozes demonic energy. Dark Shadow being set free to help his master in any way it could. Before I realized that the wound was closing fast and there was no actual pain. Shishishi, I saw what a Sobai Kun did for Momo-chan over there and decided to take a crack at it myself. You can now share your five senses with Dark Shadow freely along with being able to absorb things into it similar to a user of a certain broken fruit. The downside, Kato says before flicking the now unleashed Dark Shadow on the nose. Ugh, dick, Takoyami exclaimed, rubbing his now bruised nose. That, the god gave his bird champion a shit-eating grin before taking out a scroll. The mask god then gives it to Takoyami. Go nuts with these swords that I sealed in there, like Tenses and Jetsu the Buster Sword, and even Zelrich. Don't ask. Their real powers included, albeit limited. Just dab some blood on each seal to open it up, beware of enclosed spaces. The anime deity then sinks back into the slowly closing Garganta but then it opened once again next to a Sobai. Then meaning to ask. 1. My realm's power source room was destroyed by an evil bitch that somehow got a hold of my powers. Epic fight to get it back though so I can't be too mad. Anyways, anyone in mind to hire to rebuild it. Those who wouldn't try to steal from me unless I robbed them blind would be nice. Have you tried the Ricks and Mortys? Hey, flashback Kato's POV. Burp, get that color confused asshole. He stole my Morty. The trainer Rick exclaimed as he tried desperately to get back his ultra rare gun Morty before the big Rick League tournament started. I didn't steal. I borrowed. Flashback and back to normal POV. Not recently. Hehe. <laughs> he laughed sheepishly. A Sobai stares at Kato before sighing, tried to steal a Morty again. Nuo. Everyone could tell he was lying. I'll pay them off. This is gonna cost me some god drugs. The Sobai made a note to pay off the Ricks and send them to Kato's to help him, anything else. Yeah, Kato shouted excitedly, catching everyone's attention. When will you end up having the Turim HPMMM? The Sobai covered his fellow god's mouth and whispers in his ear. That's not for a while you dipshit. Don't spoil anything that might not happen. The Sobai says in genuine anger, he was working hard on that project and any minor deviation could ruin everything. The anime deity nods, knowing better than to spoil the more ancient god's plans, before sinking into his hollow rift, leaving everyone but a Sobai confused. You all heard nothing, got that. A series of rapidly shaking heads follow. Good. Well, we just finished your final exams. You all know what that means. A Sobai was met by complete silence as everyone stared at him. I still dulled over after last chapter's events. Still shocked over the singing Deku. They nod in unison. Who knew Deku-kun had so much talent? Achako mumbled to the other's agreement. Though at this point they shouldn't be so surprised. Everybody has talents and fields that they can thrive in. The problem is that most people only ever consider one path or a single talent to focus their efforts on. Even though most of us can become so much more. Specialization was useful, but the sheer amount of wasted talent in the world was sad to think about sometimes. Like the difference between a modern career and the Renaissance man of the 13th century. David gave his comparison. Exactly. In most modern societies you're expected to specialize yourself in order to contribute to society with some kind of service, often preventing growth in other areas. Granted this is mostly a mortal problem. Once you gain a respectable lifespan of a few million years you can afford to diversify. The mortal sweat dropped. Well, when you had that kind of time on your hands of course you'd look for interesting stuff to learn and master. Anyways time for the next episode. And it's a pretty big one, this marks the last big event you guys went through before being kid and I mean allowed to see the future. That sure got them up and in gear. Never underestimate a mortal's desire to know the future. The more convincing it is, the more desperate they get. Just look at horoscopes. Starting the projector the watchers were met by an unusual sight. Yagi was actually taking a nap for once. While he was off to dreamland, specifically down Nostalgia Lane, his successor was not so silently fanboying over the thought of getting to visit the illustrious Eye Island with his mentor. All Might, hey All Might, are you asleep? Pop there went Toshi's sleep time. Is something the matter young Midoriya? The hero said, rubbing his eyes from his power nap. It was about time to wake up anyway. Look we can see it. Right there, the floating city that can move anywhere, home to over 10,000 scientists. Eye Island. Izuku fanboyed while pressing his cheek against the glass, All Might looking over his shoulder at the familiar yet beautiful sight. I can't believe this is where I get to start summer vacation. It's so amazing. My god it's like a father-son road trip. So adorable. Maybe a family trip wouldn't be out of the question. Really? Room for one more. If there is what about us? I am sure we can pull our own weight. The majority of the room muttered the first line while most of the girls couldn't help but squeal the second. 
After a few seconds' pause, Inko had to admit that such a thing had a certain charm to it, and David wanted to know if family friends were welcome, to which Melissa nodded vigorously. Achako saying, adding her own two cents, secretly worried about the cost of something like that. There was a single dissenting voice, however. So that's how you got on the island, fucking Deku who was not happy about his rival getting a free pass to enter the island from All Might himself, though in hindsight it made a lot of sense, which only increased his anger. Though at this point the others learned how to tune him out. I didn't realize that you'd be this excited. Glad I invited you, Yagi said in amusement, though it worried Izuku a bit. Oh yeah, are you sure it's okay that I came along with you? It's not gonna be a problem. It would be weird if somebody found out that he got a free pass from All Might himself, that reeked of favoritism right there. Don't even think twice about it. The invitation was clear that I could bring whoever I want as my guest. Yagi reassured him, though Izuku was worried since that kind of thing was usually reserved for a family member. I think you're forgetting that we're connected by something far thicker than blood young Midoriya. We will forever share the bond of one for all. Hair is quite a bit thicker than blood after all. So by quipped the obvious joke, sending Izuku into yet another dry heaving spell as the others laughed at his expense. That joke will never get old. Once Yagi said that a voice over the intercom warned them that they were reaching I Island and were about to land. This is going to be monumentally exhausting. Once we reach the island I'll be forced to use my muscle form constantly. Now, it's about time for you to change as well. You got permission to bring your hero costume along right? The answer was a resounding yes as Izuku gasped with a megawatt smile at the idea. Two heroes, the mentor and his protege walking side by side even if nobody knows about the later. It does sound like something straight out of a comic book. Sadu commented, not expecting for Izuku and Momo to take out two notebooks and furiously scribble on them after he finished talking. What's with them? I expect this from Izuku but Yeyurazu too. Arriving at the island All Might tested Izuku on his trivia knowledge of the location. Only to get a much more detailed answer than what he was looking for, when will he learn that his protege was a total nerd? And it went without saying that the moment they arrived All Might was swamped by a horde of fans trying to meet him. This lasted for far longer than either of the OFA duo anticipated. Not good, if this keeps going we're in danger of being late. Izuku asked what they would be late for. Apparently, All Might wanted to meet up with an old friend, something Izuku was more than happy to do. Though he was warned once again to be tight-lipped about the secret of OFA. To their luck, a familiar face appeared to help them out. The strange part was that she happened to come in on some kind of futuristic pogo stick. To each their own I suppose. There you are uncle, finally. Melissa giggled as she got closer, jumping off her stick and glomping on the mountainous man who held her up just fine. Oh my gosh, it's been forever. She exclaimed as All Might laughed saying it was great to see her again. They kept this up, going through the whole uncle, niece routine while Deku just stood there with his usual presence of a potted plant keeping him hidden from sight. In a rare turn of events, Izuku actually got mildly annoyed that he was forgotten by the other two which caused All Might to sheepishly introduce Melissa to his protege. BFFT, plant person, I gotta write that shit down, that Kugo said in poor taste, though the joke itself was received pretty well by everyone. Even Izuku got a chuckle and at his own expense. Though most people were just gushing over the familial feeling they got when watching All Might and Melissa interact like that. Even Minda couldn't deny its wholesome charm. Oh right young Midoriya, allow me to introduce you to my friend Dave's daughter, Melissa. All Might introduced Melissa where Izuku followed suit with a handshake. Only to be caught by complete surprise when Melissa started moderately fanboying over him and his costume design, shooting rapid fire questions the whole time. Kinda like a much more composed May. Huh, May looked up from her gadgets she's been building from what she could reverse engineer within a Sobai's dimension. I could have sworn someone insulted me. Oh well, back to baby making. Cough, Melissa shall we? All might interrupt her analysis, snapping her out of her concern over Deku's scarred hands. Oh, sorry, I got distracted, if we hurry we can surprise Papa in his lab. Melissa said as she'd activated her pogo stick, which somehow went from a solid metal pole twice her own size to something akin to a roll of tape. Your world might actually be ready for the next big leap in nanotech with stuff like that. Good job, kid. A sub I gave genuine praise where it was due. That kind of downsizing tech wasn't exactly common. Even civilization centuries ahead of these guys were hard-pressed to match it. Gee, thanks. I didn't think my fun side projects were all that impressive. Melissa hadn't expected that kind of reaction from the tech-based god. A compliment got her blushing and even May took some time to look away from her work and give her a thumbs up. The scene cut out to a group of suspicious-looking figures, one of which was on the phone in broad daylight, in a place known for its vast security systems, which most likely included lip-reading cameras. Okay yeah, how did they get in here without being noticed at all? Tartarus level security my ass. Kamakiri asked out loud. Dave just rubbed the back of his head and muttered something about budget cutbacks and greedy old men. Guess the almighty yen struck again. After the small ominous scene, we find David looking at a picture of All Might in his first costume, obviously reminiscing. He was snapped out of it when his assistant Sam, who mentioned that he might want to go out and spend time with Melissa. David denied it saying that she was busy. Well, I am my father's daughter. For better and for worse. Melissa jumped in, surprising the two. 
Anyway, since you've finished the first stage of your research, I invited someone here to celebrate with us. Someone you dearly love, she said before looking back, letting Dave see who she was talking about, catching him completely by surprise. Yes, I am here, shaking with emotion for our heartfelt reunion. All Mike gave his most boisterous introduction while Dave and Sam just stared at him in shock. The whole while Izuku assumed his plant status once more, just watching the chaos. Noticing that his student was left out again, All Might went to introduce his student who was fidgeting for some reason. Young Midoriya, let me introduce you to someone incredible. David Shield he was cut off after saying his name when Izuku went into full fanboy mode. Melissa couldn't help but giggle at the admittedly cute moment. I wasn't that bad was I? Oh who am I kidding, I'm still kinda that bad. Self-conscious thoughts filled his mind. Shrugging off the young man's enthusiasm David asked everyone if he and All Might could have some time to catch up with each other. Really he just wanted everyone out so that Tashinori could transform back since he reached his limit. In the meantime, Melissa would show Izuku around the island, something she was more than happy to do, and Izuku was ecstatic about it. Or Deku, as he asked to be called. So it wasn't a date. Or maybe it turned into one halfway through. Achako, Gyro, and Momo whispered amongst themselves, being the girls that caught Izuku in the act. Melissa noticing this just blushed a bit and gave them a teasing wink. Looks like I found my own faded rival Deku-kun. I won't give up so easily, even if she's cute, a genius, probably rich, and quirkless like you. Oh, who am I kidding? I have no chance. Noticing how panicked Achako got, Melissa decided to try and escalate things before anyone got hurt. Don't worry Achako-chan, for now, we can all be the best of friends. We should wait until all this is over then we can cross that bridge together. The hidden meaning behind those words was lost to Melissa though Achako and her emotionally compromised state picked up on the hints that weren't really there. Few nosebleeds. I I'll think about it. She whispered, remembering the various other Izuku and how they seemed to make polyamory work. It was pretty shocking apparently since Gyro almost gave the game away by choking on her own saliva after hearing it with crystal clear reception. Thankfully Momo was just as oblivious as Melissa. For now, they spent a considerable amount of time just walking around, seeing the sights while Melissa went through some of the island's history and upcoming events. Deku listening intently, though he did get distracted once or twice as notable pro heroes walked by, including the king of all monster references. Look over here. You definitely need to check this place out. Melissa called a massive building to Izuku's attention. It was the local exhibit for the various hero tech invented on the island, most of which were built with patents made by David Shield himself. This time it was Achako who busted out the notepad, mumbling furiously about the ideal date and pandering to his inner nerd. Sadly the number of zeros attached to such activities quickly drained her enthusiasm. At least until Momo checked her work and gushed over how fun such a thing would be for a group outing. I'll take what I can get. Achako cheered internally, thank god for wealthy friends. Wow, you must be really proud of him, I think it's great that your dad is someone you can look up to like that. Strangely enough, when Izuku said this he wasn't thinking of his own father. Or maybe he was, just not his biological one. Melissa smiled and admitted that she wanted to be a great inventor like her father and that she was a student at the I Island Academy, a school that Izuku recognized as being the best in the world. You must be a real genius, he said making Melissa shake her head, saying that she still had a lot to learn. Wait isn't this just like? The group flashed back to when the two had a very similar conversation about Izuku's promising future. I still have plenty to learn, lots of training. They really are alike. Uncle Might holds a special place in your heart doesn't he Deku-kun? I still can't get over how you were geeking out earlier, Melissa said, giggling causing Izuku to blush and rub the back of his head bashfully. You look like you're having fun, Deku-kun. A familiar voice, at least for Izuku came from behind the pair, causing the green wannabe hero to turn back at record speed. Hey, you're Raka-sen. What are you doing here? A confused Deku asked, surprise in his voice. You look like you're having fun, Achako repeated. You said it again. Wait, you didn't think that was about we were Jew how dense was I back then? The now wiser, more worldly Deku realized just how bad of a position he was in back then, though his speech skills haven't improved much. The men of the room couldn't do much but close their eyes and leave Izuku to the wolf pack that was about to pounce. How cute Izuku-kun, getting interrupted on your first date with Melissa-chan, and by Achako-chan no less. How unlucky. Toru heckled him, elbowing his side a bit, Mina joining in from his other side. Even Suyu was chuckling to herself, mostly because they were unlucky enough to be stuck in a hotel while all this was happening. Momo and Jiru stayed back for the moment, knowing that their time was coming. Puff, you seem to be having a good time. Midoriya, I heard everything. Like clockwork the two ladies showed up, surprising Izuku once again. Jiru's earphone jacked the ultimate spy tech. Izuku freaked out for a moment before regaining his composure and introducing Melissa, only to immediately lose it again when she almost let it slip that he was here thanks to All Might. You know, we were wondering about that ourselves but never brought it up. You being on the island makes a lot more sense now, Momo said offhandedly. How else would a jobless high school student be able to get into one of the world's most exclusive cities for one of its most exclusive events? The rest of the people who came were either extremely rich, long-standing hero families, famous athletes, or the guests of the previously mentioned. Oh, and two lucky idiots that somehow managed to get part-time jobs on the island. 
Jiro added her two cents, including the obligatory arrow in the heart of the two idiots who know who they are. Why don't we all go grab some tea at the cafe? Melissa deflected the conversation quite effectively as mere minutes later the group of girls plus one houseplant were seen with various beverages at a cafe, recounting the events of their internships to Melissa who was drinking it all in. While the girls were talking Izuku sighed in relief, the possible fustercluck that could have happened was de-escalated. That was until someone placed a drink next to his face. Thanks for waiting. Izuku knew that voice. Kaminori kun And is that mighty kun Izuku and Achako exclaimed respectively. What are you guys doing here? Achako asked. Apparently they were accepted for part-time jobs at the island, taking advantage of it to visit the expo, and to try their luck with the local girls according to Minta, who immediately jumped Izuku on how he knew Melissa. Why were they so excited about me? It's not like you girls are any less attractive. Melissa asked the other girls, getting shrugs. You didn't know about their perviness ahead of time so they tried their luck I guess. Also, we have no blondes. It was as likely of a reason as any. The blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Megan-wearing foreigner was a pretty popular trope after all. The two tried and failed to brag in front of Melissa before they were caught out and scolded by an angry Ada who made his way to the group, Quirk fully active as he took advantage of the freedom the island gave him. It was pretty nice to stretch my legs so to speak, Ada admitted, further convincing the adults that Quirk training areas might be a good idea in general. Quirk atrophy was a real problem and this might lower such cases dramatically. The group ended up explaining how each of them came to the island, the two rich kids being invited directly while Achako and Gyro came as guests. Banged. However, a fairly large explosion in the distance caught everyone's attention before they could question how Izuku got there. Honestly I thought you had a secret girlfriend that let you in. Achako gave her earlier theory, one that launched the entire room into complete silence. Until they all burst out into deep laughter, uncontrollable and unprecedented. All except for Izuku, who blushed with a tiny bit of righteous anger. I is it that hard to believe that I had a G girlfriend? He muttered, which Achako managed to catch. Deku-kun, you nearly passed out the second time we talked. The first time you didn't even react until I already left. Okay, point taken, he was getting better okay. Hiroshima, Izuku exclaimed in surprise at seeing another classmate here. Melissa, connecting the dots guessed correctly that Kirishima was also from UA, and in the meantime, the announcer called out the next contestant. Eh, hey, Kakan too. Izuku exclaimed again, this time with much more surprise and a bit of dread in his voice. He could already hear the yelling. I don't know why you were so surprised, little green, those two rarely go anywhere without the other. Much to Bekugo's chagrin, though I think everyone knew that the firecracker had a soft spot for the red-haired rock. Shut up. It ain't my fault that this rock for brains keeps following me like a fucking barnacle. He just kept annoying me until I gave up my plus one to shut him up. Sure you did, there was never any doubt Mr. Hubert Sundir. After the explosive cactus demolished the fairly weak robots in record time it was Izuku's poor luck that Kirishima noticed him in the stands, picking him out in particular instead of his other classmates for some reason. Oh, now that I think about it Izuku-san has kind of become the face of class 1A hasn't he? Not that I mind, he definitely a more likable person than the alternative. Setsuna teased Bakugo while bringing up a good point. Even before the whole watching the past thing happened Izuku was pretty much the de facto leader of 1A. Sure he gave the position of class rep to Iida but most people followed Deku's league over most others. Damn it, what are you doing here D.E.K.U.? The blonde bomber yelled as Iida tried to calm him down only to get yelled at even more. Meanwhile, Melissa was asking the same question that most people did upon meeting Bakugo. Why is that boy so angry? A collective snort rang out, Melissa herself just shrugged. She was still wondering exactly why the explosive teen had such a short fuse. She was half convinced that he was one of the few examples of quirks affecting their users' personalities, but that was going into the territory of pseudoscience. Don't even try it, Deki, there's no way you'll get a better score than I did. Like Hugo growled at Kirishima's suggestion for the others to try out the villain course. Yeah, you're probably right. Izuku tried to put out the fire, not wanting to cause any trouble. Huh, I'm not so sure, only one way to find out I guess. Iraka said with a thinking pose, adding gasoline to the flame. Yeah, you're probably right. Ugh. Deku repeated without thinking, placing himself directly into the inferno. BFFT. Nice going at Chako-chan. Whenever Izuku-kun interacts with Bakugo-kun he tends to speak without thinking, that was perfect timing. Ashido congratulated the gravity girl who simply shrugged. I was just being honest. After Deku-kun's show and All Might Sensei's rescue training, I had no reason to believe that he was weaker or slower than Bakugo-san. And I was right, Deku-kun might have lost but it was only by a second. Izuku's impressive performance was shown on screen to prove her point. Though it didn't last long since Todoroki came in right after to pass Bakugo's score by a single second. Okay, I call bullshit on that one by the way. That happened in way less than 10 seconds. Mind eyeballed the time, even though it didn't show Todoroki starting the test all he did was create a single iceberg that destroyed or captured all of the pseudo-villains at the same time. There was no way that it took that long for the ice to cover them all. Todoroki just shrugged. They probably only counted the points after each villain robot shut down, I guess my ice took a few seconds to destroy their inner circuitry. 
He didn't really care if anything beating Bakugo's score by a single second was better in his mind. By the way, nice eye there Melissa Chan, you connected the dots a lot faster than we did, granted it wasn't the full truth. Jairo congratulated the blonde inventor for her good intuition while Suyu lightly grumbled about getting it first, granted it took her a day or two to vocally connect Izuku's strength with All Might's. Melissa was praising the Hero Core students for their great potential after seeing their monster trio fight one after the other, prompting a bit of giggling. At least until Bakugo blew off towards Todoroki, anger on his face. Though that statement was a bit redundant. Out of the way icy hot bastard. You can't just appear out of nowhere and show me up. He yelled to no effect, Todoroki as cool as ever just acknowledged his presence with a name before turning his attention to the others. Midoriya and the others are here too. He said, completely ignoring Bakugo, with predictable results. It got so bad that Ida, Kirishima, and Izuku had to jump in to hold Bakugo back. Never a dull day indeed. And why did you single out Izuku-san back then Todoroki-san? Something we need to know. Jairo tried to tease only to receive a straight-laced answer. Izuku is my best friend and rival. Why wouldn't I do that? Todoroki asked confused, head tilted to the side. Too pure. Went through everyone's mind. The bromance was real. With a quick cutaway to a random mascot, we now see the villainous group tying up and hiding a group of security guards. The leader of this group had just finished a phone call. All Might is here. Whatever, we'll take care of him no problem. Okay, usually I'd say famous last words but that metal fucker actually almost pulled it off. Back Hugo couldn't help but comment. And he would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for you meddling hero kids and that brilliant scientist. Asobai couldn't help himself and made the reference, sadly only the nerds of the group recognized it. The next scene showed David giving All Might a full physical examination, arriving at the disturbing results that Tashinori's quirk levels had severely declined, to the point where the quirk factor that was previously just fine could barely be measured at all. I don't get it Toshi, why are your quirk levels going down so dramatically? Even with your serious injury, this kind of quirk decay is just absurd, I'd even say medically impossible without an external cause. It was the equivalent of someone slowly losing pieces of their DNA over time, and then suddenly having half the genome erased out of nowhere. All Might coughed into his hand, sad that he had to lie to his friend. I guess being a hero for so long has finally caught up to me. At that point David didn't even try to piece it together he was too caught up with what the loss of the world's symbol of peace would mean. Damn 6%, and the rest of the world is averaging 20%. I get that superpowers becoming commonplace was bound to raise the crime rates by a little bit shit. You can't expect me to believe that 20% of the world's population is a criminal in one way or another. As Sobai said, genuinely surprised by the statistic. Frankly, if things were that bad then there were some serious systemic issues that needed to be solved. There was no way those kinds of stats could come about from regular human sin or negligence. To be blunt I agree, there's no mistaking the fact that crime has gone up on average ever since the emergence of quirks but such an increase was borderline impossible. I assume that the mysterious supervillain that took down All Might had something to do with it. Aizawa agreed while casually asking All Might who was the most informed on the topic. Most likely, I don't know for sure, he's been active for over a century now. I wouldn't be surprised if he has his claws deep into the framework of quirk society, even after I beat him his known lackeys were still active. And there were hundreds of those, who knows how many other fools took up his banner that we never discovered. That was the real terrifying part about fighting all for one. The man alone was a threat, but his influence was far deadlier. He was like a venomous jellyfish. Even if you killed the head the stingers were still dangerous. To be fair there are certain crimes that have become a near universal part of modern society simply because of the volatility of some quirks. Minor property damage, accidental injuries, the occasional cape incident. But I agree in general, 20% is far too high to attribute to such accidental crimes alone. Midnight pointed out, the kids with more volatile quirks looked away awkwardly, each having some pretty close calls when they were kids but thankfully the people that were around when it happened were understanding. Hell, even All Might looked awkward as he reminisced about exactly why he chose to go capeless after the Silver Age. The video starring the incident had nearly a billion views the last time he checked. Don't worry my friend, if such a villain did appear I have no intention of stepping down. All Might said, there is still hope, for the future of one for all and the symbol of peace. A new generation will rise to take my place. The screen shifts to Izuku and the gang hanging out with Melissa, the camera focusing on the symbol of peace's successor. From there we see a quick cutaway to the hero students and their antics, and the two poor perverts being shown some leniency by Melissa who invited them to that night's party, much to their gratitude. Though she still needed to do something before calling it a night. Deku-kun, can I show you something before you get ready for tonight? She asked politely, the camera switching once again to David's flashback. Who? Getting invited to a girl's room all by yourselves. Aren't you lucky? Satsuna teased her fellow Greenette, though by this point he was used to it. It was really cool actually, I wonder if I Island accepts postgraduates. Izuku asked genuinely, whenever he did become a hero this school looked like a good place to expand his horizons even further. We do have a university, I might even be able to put in a good word for you Izuku-kun. And if you're as intelligent as I think you are I think you'll do just fine. 
the world could use more scientifically literate heroes after all. There's no reason for the future number one to limit himself to a high school education. All along Melissa was shaking on the spot in excitement. There was certainly something to look forward to when they got back to their world. After Dave's flashback was finished, to the smiling faces of our watchers who much enjoyed the second-degree nostalgia, especially a certain fanboy. There was another quick scene showing the Magneto ripoff preparing for his grand appearance, which was completely ignored as the watchers put all of their focus on Izuku's upcoming interaction with Melissa. What? Did you think that two-bit villain was worth much attention? With the crap these watchers have seen so far Wolfram barely registered as a threat. I feel like you guys are way too interested in my love life. Izuku sweat drop. They had gotten to the point where his relationships with the girls superseded actual villain activity. His whole experience might have some unforeseen side effects. Of course. That's our job Izuku-kun, you're like the little brother in our dysfunctional family so shouldn't it be our job to tease you at every possible turn. Sato said while giving Izuku a playful noogie, the others giggling along while Inko merely nodded in agreement. What kind of mother would she be if she didn't tease her son about girls? Wow, this place looks so professional. I can't believe you get to study in a place like this. And all these trophies, you must be really talented. Izuku praised the place, taken aback by how cutting edge everything was. Actually, not long ago I was getting terrible grades. That's why I've been studying so much lately. I gotta be a good student if I wanna be a hero. She said, taking Izuku by surprise. He asked if she meant a pro hero. Oh no, I gave up on that dream a while ago. And quirkless after all. It's almost identical. Melissa-chan has pretty much the same backstory as you, that's so unfair. Why is it always Izuku-sen that gets all the luck? Mindo exclaimed, though he was the only one thinking it. Many were surprised at exactly how similar these two were, with varying degrees of jealousy mixed in. Some however were encouraging Melissa instead. Not all heroes wear capes Melissa-chan. I know some pros that would kill to have a support gear creator with even half your skill. Midnight exclaimed, patting the girl on the back. And even if you did want to be a traditional hero we've seen that it can be done. How many Izukus end up becoming a hero even without a quirk so by San? Mirio asked the resident god for his input, there had to be at least a few right. Truth be told for every world with an overpowered Izuku there's at least one more where he never gains a special power. More often than not he basically becomes the Batman of his world, or something similar. A Sobai supplied happily, there was always something endearing about a hero making a name for himself with nothing but their own grit, wit, and determination. Instead of becoming a hero directly, I want to be like my father. A hero who helps bring peace with the power of science. Here, try this on. It's a support item that I developed after watching Uncle Might use his powers. Just click the button here. She instructed, the two small strips of material folding out into a bandage like red glove. As it turned out, Melissa used her huge brain to figure out that Izuku needed to hold back most of his power in order to avoid damaging his body. Something that the now-dubbed Full Gauntlet would help do by regulating his energy and absorbing a good deal of the recoil. Again, that was an incredibly advanced piece of technology for your world. A nanotech glove that can absorb the equivalent of several gigatons of TNT a total of three times. Hell, I'm still trying to work out how you managed it with nothing but the materials provided for you. It sure was a thinker. The nanotech design obviously helped, repairing the glove as the damage is created but still. It was a truly impressive feat. Oh, I just used a tungsten, titanium, gold alloy to maximize energy absorption and flexibility when I created it. To be honest most of the stuff that went into that glove came to me in a dream so even I have no idea how to make it again. Ah, so it was proto-adamantium, got it. Um, now that I think about it, this is about the time when the party is supposed to start right. A Sobai asked out loud, baiting his two targets. That's right. That means we'll be able to see the girls in those gorgeous formal clothes again too. How lucky can we get? Minda cried tears of joy while his second in command tried to remain composed. Which makes this the perfect time to pause for a commercial break. I popped their bubble with a smile on my face. You monster. H how long was that commercial break? I feel like we've just been sitting here for. I don't even know anymore. Minda, who had been kept conscious through the power of sheer perversion and caffeine spoke up to the confusion of the rest of his classmates and one elder god. Wake you were awake this whole time. I just went out to get interdimensional groceries and put this place on pause until I got back. You actually stayed conscious for several months just for the chance to see the girls in formal wear again. Seriously. I mean sure the whole scene was the definition of waifu bait but damn man. Even the power of boners must have some limits. Never underestimate the determination of a true man of culture. I would walk through the fires of Tartarus if it meant seeing the light of Elysium at the end. Did you read through my classical literature while I was gone? The Sobai hit the nail on the head. Yes months of boredom would drive a great boy to do many things. At least he didn't look through his notes on other universes. Or gods forbid the multiversal internet. Minda Sans deranged perversion aside, can we get on with this? I'm not exactly comfortable knowing that we've effectively been frozen for the better part of a year and I'd like to repress that knowledge as soon as possible please. Gyro broke a Sobai out of his existential crisis with a fair point. The show must go on and such. The scene opened up right after Melissa urged Izuku to be a true hero someday followed by Ida's call to hurry up to the party, completely breaking the earlier mood. 
Whoops. With a speed that was most likely helped by full cowling, Izuku somehow found a way to dress himself and arrive at the meeting spot only slightly before the girls did. Speaking of which, Achako was the first to make her appearance, wearing a beautiful pink and white dress along with her usual black tights and some dark red shoes. A white rose with black ribbon on her hair finishing the look, most of which were courtesy of Momo much to Achako's and the general male population's appreciation. Speaking of the Ravenet, she along with Gyro made their way onto the scene soon after, sporting a simple lime-colored dress and sash, and a more complex but exotically beautiful pink-purple dress with a leather jacket combo respectively. Their hair also had rather nice accessories which paired well with the formal wear. Yeyurazu sends the best. Thank you for gracing us with such beauty so many times over in just one night. The raven-haired girl simply looked away from the two hyper-excited members of her class, hoping that they'd stop soon. She did however give a smile to the girls who borrowed some of her outfits for the party, it was a favor she wouldn't regret. And of course, everyone gave Izuku and Achako a proper ribbing for his past self's comment on her dress and Achako's own embarrassing reaction. Though by this point they managed to take it in stride, only showing minor blushes at how obvious they were being in hindsight. I do have to agree, the outfits are rather nice. And I have to add that the jacket doesn't ruin anything great boy, if anything it adds some nice contrast with the dress. All in all I approve of the style. So by putting his two cents along with the silent approval of several other true men of culture, they all appreciated the unique aspects of the costume as Gyro described it. Then, of course, there was the more classical beauty of Melissa's outfit. A white skirt with a black second layer followed by purplish blue dress separated by a black sash with a white rose acting as the pin holding it in place. That along with the raised hair and the sudden lack of glasses made for quite the stunning result. While the TV and watching dynamic duo lost their minds over Melissa's dress, the intellectuals of the group asked the real hard-hitting questions. So were you wearing contact lenses there or are you only slightly nearsighted? Ida asked in genuine curiosity as a fellow glasses wearer. The former, I have prescriptions for both but I find contact lenses to be too tedious to keep up with so I only use them for special occasions. Melissa answered while trying her best to ignore the quartet of idiots singing her praises. Don't get her wrong, she was flattered and all but there were limits. Speaking of special occasions, All Might was currently being put on the spot before he could even enjoy his glass of what appeared to be champagne. The scene then alternated between All Might's embarrassed and prompt to speech and Bakugo slowly building murderous rage at being lost along with Kirishima. So you didn't decide to blow off the party, at least you had the excuse of getting lost. Ida acknowledged. It was fair enough, my island was huge and he couldn't blame those two for getting lost, especially without a phone or anything to guide them to where they needed to go. Quiet you. In the end, I guess it turned out fine. I got to kick the asses of those two mooks after all. A smirk was on the blonde bomber's face as he remembered that fight. It wasn't his best one but it was still pretty fun to see that idiot's face right before half and half blew him up. Soon afterward, an emergency signal was seen and an alarm went off warning the residents of the island that there was a reported bomb threat. This was followed up by a group of armed villains entering the party hall with their leader stating his demands. If you couldn't tell, we have full control over this island's security systems. If you know what's good for you, you'll stay where you are and won't move a muscle. I'm sure you heroes wouldn't want the blood of innocent civilians on your conscience right. Wolfram threatened before activating the experimental restraint systems, powerful enough to immobilize even All Might. Meanwhile, with the main characters for the night, Melissa was trying to figure out why the island system suddenly went on high alert despite it going against protocol. Deku who sensed something was up elected to go to where the party was being held, saying that All Might would be there to the surprise of the other students. Honestly, we really should have realized something was up by then. You were the only one who conveniently knew that All Might was on the island along with where he would be. That and knowing who Melissa's dad was should have been a major flag. Gyro sighed, granted she wasn't a hero nerd on Izuku's level. Nobody was, but still, the signs were pretty blatant. Hey, I blame the stress of the situation. Toru jumped in. Fair enough, a terrorist attack would tend to leave you a bit off balance. We'll follow your lead Melissa, you know this place better than anyone. Izuku said as the rest followed her. Upon reaching the party location only a few floors up Izuku managed to get All Might's attention by flashing his phone in his eyes. From there Gyro was able to relay a message from their fallen teacher. This is bad, All Might told us to get out of here while we can. What do you guys think? Ida and Momo were in agreement, thinking that All Might would know best and that they were just students, Maita was also on board for plan, run away. To which Kaminari added that they should try to find heroes from outside to help. Aren't we trying to be pros ourselves? Is it right for us to do nothing even knowing that our inaction could lead to innocent deaths? Todoroki was firmly on the side of taking action, something which pushed Izuku to voice his agreement. Q powerful shonen protagonist speech. Huh, at least the recording is self-aware. You're pretty good at this whole public speaking thing, huh? Kendo, who had long since accepted the fact that Class 1AS unofficial leader was some kind of main character archetype, spoke up. 
Still, wouldn't this count as an illegal action from Hero students? I actually did a bit of digging on that afterward, just to make sure that those who saved me didn't get into any legal troubles. My island is a multinational location which is technically under the jurisdiction of international law. Normally this would mean that citizens of each country would be subject to their respective laws within the island. However, exceptions are made in times of duress, such as in a terrorist attack. David spoke up, clearing up the legal question. It only made sense, after all, if something like a terrorist organization attacked the UN then it would become an all-hands-on-deck situation. Nobody was about to complain about a few citizens taking matters into their own hands, especially when the alternative was the equivalent of letting a known terrorist get his hands on the quirk equivalent of the super soldier serum. Legal issues aside the students ended up following Izuku with his idea to help out. Melissa, who knew where the security system was, decided that going there would be their best bet. Before this plan could go through though, Izuku decided to signal All Might about his intentions. Oh no, he doesn't plan on running away, does he? Tisk, I should be furious about him going against my wishes. But who am I kidding? If he didn't act now then he wouldn't be my successor now, would he? I'll just have to maintain this form for as long as I can. Our fates are in your hands, fledgling heroes. All Might thought while hiding his smirk, he just had to have faith in them. The students were making their way up the emergency stairs slowly but surely, already reaching the 30th floor out of. 0. .200. They quickly realized that they weren't getting anywhere fast and soon enough they found that the stairs were blocked off anyway. Now they had two options, try to find another way up or open one of the locked doors which would alert the Nevermind Mind have made the choice for them whether they liked it or not. Bonehead move or not we kinda needed to do that. There was no other way up unless we wanted to blow a hole to the roof of the place. Gyro sighed, they could have gone that route but that would have used up one of Izuku's 100% hits, not that they knew that back then. Sometimes the direct approach is the correct one. Thankfully the enemy was stupid and only sent a few mooks your way instead of doubling down on their hostage threat. Asobai received many worried looks at that. What? Just because I don't partake in the villainy myself. Much. Doesn't mean that I can't know the tricks of the trade. We choose to ignore that. The watchers say collectively, not wanting to go down that mental path for even a moment. After Minda opened a random door the villains went on high alert and many of the corridors were being locked down. Luckily they managed to find an unblocked entrance which Ida made quick work of with his special attack, never skip leg day. It was a plant factory of all things, though that didn't really matter at the moment. What it was the fact that Gyro could hear multiple people approaching from a nearby elevator. Deciding not to try their luck the group hid behind some foliage and waited for whoever it was to arrive. It was indeed two villains, both decked out in some pretty heavy gear, however instead of finding the current group, their attention was taken by two seriously unlucky individuals. I mean really, who get so lost that they end up 80 floors above where they were supposed to be. Meanwhile on a certain pirate ship, a CHOO, huh, whatever, a moss-headed swordsman went back to sleep. Back to the plot. Hey, maybe you can help us. We couldn't find the party and we're hoping that you could give us directions. Kirishima asked nicely, not reading the mood at all. Do you think we're stupid? Don't you dare lie to us. The skinnier villain went for an attack which Bakugo tried to deflect, though Todoroki beat him to it with an ice wall much to their surprise. What? Todoroki? Kirishima saw who blocked the somewhat literal bullet for him. What's going on here? You guys find another way up this tower, the three of us should be able to handle these two no problem. And Kirishima, villains are invading, no time to explain. Ever the conversationalist Todoroki summed up the situation while also giving his classmates and Melissa a boost to the higher floors. Just in time too since Dollar Store Law and Dollar Store Purple Hulk broke out of Todoroki's ice soon after. Almost immediately taking Kirishima out of the fight with a single hit after Bakugo underestimated the dumb one's strength. This was going to be a bit tougher than they thought. Speaking of tough, the larger hero group was busy trying to convince Mina to grow some non-purple balls and climb up the side of the tower Mission Impossible style to let down a ladder for the rest of them. It was a hard-fought battle but eventually, the power of lust was enough to get the young grape to do what was needed. Though in the end, all that Mina needed as a reward for his efforts was some basic acknowledgement from Melissa. Huh, huh indeed. Who knew our resident pervert was weak to genuine praise. Sadu said good-naturedly and made the mistake of trying to give Mina a noogie. For the sake of time, we shall leave this scene to your imagination. Well obviously, everyone knows that once you go too deep into the perverse side of things vanilla becomes the new kink. Like holding hands. Bunch of degenerates these days I swear. And in public too. What was this world coming to? Memes aside, Bakugo had just finished soloing the Purple Hulk who was too stupid to dodge the incoming special move that the explosion boy even had the decency of yelling out. It was lights out for him, and his partner was soon to follow. Seeing that his partner was taken out, Dollar Store Law sent out a distortion wave that tore off a bit of Bakugo's clothes and to the villain's misfortune, got a bit of his explosive sweat on his webbed hands. What the? The villain asked confused. That's the sweat from my palms. It works like nitroglycerin. Hearing this Todoroki immediately sent a blast of flame at the villain, causing the sweat to explode and somehow not killing the guy instantly after it exploded. Instead, Todoroki gave him frostbite by freezing his body right after. 
are we going to talk about the stupid level of durability some people have even without protective quirks? That explosion looked like it could have blown up a small house and that skinny one just took it to the face with seemingly no injuries. Tetsu Tetsu pointed out, internally quite miffed by the breach in logic that had become so common. He searched for an answer from the heavens. Humans are fucking weird. And got his answer. Fair. Asobi wasn't wrong. Quirk scientists barely understood what the hell was going on with active quirks let alone the passive stuff that tends to stay under the radar. Wait, are you seriously stuck? Just turn your quirk off, you damn idiot. And thank you. Bakugo muttered after seeing Kirishima's predicament much to the rock boy's sheepish acknowledgement. Only for that sheepishness to turn to shock as his stone brain registered Bakugo's last words. Whoa, where'd that come from? Don't worry about it I would have taken that hit for you any time. Hiroshima was ecstatic after witnessing one of Bakugo's rare moments of gratitude which of course brought the explosive boy soon soon out to the surface once again. Ending it off with what could equate to a miracle so by shut off the projector much to the disappointment of the watchers. It was just getting to the good part damn it. Sorry kids and grown adults that still amount to children. That's all the time we have for today. I have some business to take care of and must leave you to your own devices again. Don't worry, I won't be freezing time for half a year this time. Maybe just a week instead, ciao. He trolled one last time before leaving the room to itself. Alright, I'm back and it didn't even take a week. Sorry about the whole, freezing you in space time thing. I've been dealing with quite a few issues lately and this is just a security measure to keep my stuff safe. So by burst into the watching room, freeing his prize oh I mean guests from their frozen states. Safe from what? Do you need assistance? Toshinori asked, outwardly relaxed but internally worried about anything that could make their usually unflappable host afraid enough to set up security measures. Don't you worry your sunken little eyes over it. I got it covered, now, let's get on to the story. In this episode, Deku straight up murders a fool. Ignoring the wide-eyed looks and choking coughs Asobi turned on the projector while everyone who wasn't there to see it rushed Izuku to ask him what happened. Jay just watch, I think I know what he's talking about but I was hoping that the villain survived. Now the others were really interested, they were sure that it was a case of self-defense but still. What could have caused Izuku to even accidentally kill a villain? When last we left our heroes the villains finally decided to get serious. Now instead of sending out two untrained and moderately annoying mooks they sent out a couple dozen Dalek ripoffs that would be better described as punching bags. Their main claim to fame, tanking a full-powered shock from Kaminari. That's it. They were soon punched to death all at once by a single 30% smash courtesy of the green cinnamon roll. I can't help but agree, I expected a lot more for my island security. If I knew that they'd just charge at us in a straight line and that they were only equipped with grapple guns I would have never wasted time creating those smoke bombs. Momo's relief and disappointment were clear to see. At least it made fighting them easy. Wow, Deku-kun that glove is amazing where'd you get it? Achako had only seen Izuku pull off something similar a few times before and they all cost the boy at least a finger. Whoever made that thing had her thanks. It worked perfectly Melissa, thanks. And jealousy. She couldn't be angry though, it really was an amazing invention. Though this brief hint of jealousy was quickly turned to amusement when she learned that Izuku only brought it because he had no idea how to take it off his arm. Girl, you're too cute sometimes you know that. By the way, am I the only one that thinks red looks good on Midori-kun? Maybe you should add a bit more of that to your costume along with the usual green. Mina suggested. It would certainly give him some variety. Plus, green, black, and red were a pretty good combination. I'll think about it. Izuku wasn't against it, it's not like his current costume would be his last one. He still had time to update it before making his heroic debut. And even then, All Might had several costumes that were highly varied over the years so there was no reason why he couldn't do the same. The villains had gotten smarter. Now they completely cut off their own communications on the off chance that the enemy students had quirks that could spy on them. Which to be fair, they did. About two minutes ago until Kaminari went full retard, but hey, they couldn't have known that. Of course, that meant that the Daleks now had to rely on their base programming to apprehend the hero students. Programming that was taken straight from the CIS, huge numbers, walking slowly towards their target with no actual plan. It took a single kick, some sticky balls, and a cannon for some reason to take them all down. Note to self, think up a lesson plan to teach these kids the meaning of pacing themselves at a later date. Aizawa wrote into a notebook that he always kept on himself to the nodding approval of the other teachers. Overkill might be the best kind of kill, but heroes were taught to avoid killing in the first place. Okay, that was a stupid metaphor but you get what I'm going for. Don't stop Deku-kun, we need to keep running or everything Ada-kun and the others did would be for nothing. And if she were being honest, she was pretty sure they had this. I mean, those robot things weren't much of a threat, it would be a pretty embarrassing battle to lose. Meanwhile with the unnecessary sacrifices. Out of mana. I need healing. The speedy bruiser yelled as his engines jammed, stranding him in the middle of a sea of Daleks that proceeded to tie him up and then gently bump into him. Out of ammo, yeah Momo we need more. The girl who forgot that she could disable machines with a tap of her earlobes yelled out in panic. I I can't do it anymore. I'm at my limit, and need. And need a buffet to recharge. Why did they think it was a good idea to leave every fighter with limited stamina back here again? Minda was also at his limit and was bleeding profusely from his scalp. 
Kaminari was still weighing so no help from here either. In the immortal words of Tony Stark, not a great plan, back to the love triangle. Izuku Achako and Melissa finally made it outside where they found a giant wind energy farm, at the top of which was an emergency exit they could enter while avoiding all of the robots without much issue. All they needed to do was use zero gravity to make it up there, a prospect that made the determined blonde nervous she'd admit. Unfortunately, the Daleks found their location before the nerd couple was halfway up, forcing Achako to stand her ground so that her quirk didn't release accidentally. Which wouldn't really be much of a problem, she wasn't sure why those two were so worried when all that it would take was a touch to disable these bow boom. Or Bakugo could just blow them all up at once. That's cool too I guess. Kirishima and Todoroki are also here, that's nice. She wasn't gonna complain about the backup but internally she just thought that she had it handled either way. Huh, what was wrong with us back then? We're usually way smarter than this. I could have propelled myself with full cowling and a few 30% Delaware smashes and we would have made it up there way faster. We wouldn't have even needed Kakan and Todoroki-kun's cool heat engine trick to help us make it. It was almost like they forgot half of what they could do for the sake of teamwork and plot convenience. Nah, that couldn't be right. Deku, we're going to hit the wall. Melissa warned as they approached the completely metal wall at speeds that could rival a car, yet Izuku wasn't worried. After all, he still had Melissa's gift and knew exactly what to use it for. One full-powered smash later and they made it in, allowing Achako to finally release her quirk and focus on the Dalek. It was too bad that Izuku and Melissa were still about 10 meters high off the ground. And upside down. The poor fools crashed into the ground, reverse lotus style, though thankfully Izuku's thick skull took most of the impact and was more than used to heavy blows. Whoops, was all Achako could say as she rubbed the back of her head sheepishly. Her bad. At this point, Dollar Store Magneto has had enough and decided to make his way up the tower himself. The only way to get a job done right was to do it yourself. But first, he'd send his second in command Mook just in case it was an overreaction. Oh yeah, time to show these kids what a real villain is like. Dollar Store Soul Evans muttered before jumping Izuku and Melissa who were just looking over each other for injuries. Landing blade first right into the floor as Izuku noticed the attack coming and got them both out of there before blocking another slash with his full gauntlet. Deku, who was too shocked by the sudden attack to think rationally, decided to question the villain who had a blade centimeters from his face instead of activating full cowling, causing him to fall victim to a second arm blade and nearly take a literal fall off the tower if he hadn't grabbed onto a nearby ledge. The villain made an attempt to finish the job but was held up by Melissa who bought Deku a few precious seconds, earning a small cut on her arm for her troubles. Thankfully this bought them just enough time for Izuku to climb back up and nail the villain with a direct 30% smash to the face, sending him spinning and into a crater several meters wide and over a meter deep. Well, that guy's fucking dead. Not that he didn't have it coming but damn, remind me not to piss off Deku too much sometimes. Back Hugo personally appreciated the swift action, brutality aside. He wasn't gonna stop giving Izuku shit of course, but his respect for the guy just went up several notches. Looking to All Might for what they expected to be disapproval, they instead only got a shrug, shocking both Izuku and Bakugo. What? He tried to kill my successor and my niece. Hell, he would have probably done the same thing in the heat of the moment if he weren't so experienced in these kinds of things. After a quick heart-to-heart, -heart, the titular two heroes made their way further up the tower, possibly murdering or giving severe brain trauma to two more mooks with machine guns along the way. Modern-day body armor could only do so much against what could equate to a cannonball to the chest and a fall at terminal velocity from some stairs after all. Finally, after making it to the top floor and finding David and his assistant there Melissa, in particular, was met with something horrible. A betrayal that would scar her for all of two hours for how relatively minor it was compared to the rest of the crap she had experienced that day. As it turned out, this whole situation was really just an elaborate ruse for the sake of taking back one of David's inventions from the sponsors who called for the project to be cancelled. A project that would help return All Might to his former strength. Which brings up the question, why didn't he just make a backup of all the data he collected during his research and put it on a hard drive or something? She David nearly cursed at the blatantly obvious solution that he could have taken instead of listening to Sam's half-baked plan. It's not like he ever needed the prototype anyway. He could have always continued his research further and made a better one later down the line. Fake villains. Would a fake villain try to kill us? Melissa showed the cut on her arm from the previous villain, shocking David and completely derailing his already weak faith in the plan. He looked back at Sam who was sweating heavily. Of course it was all a performance, but the real act was pretending we weren't criminals. Dollar Store Magneto made his dramatic entrance, only for Deku to rush him immediately after realizing that he was the boss of the villains from earlier, only to be slammed back and help up against a wall by several steel ropes made by Wolfram. You'd be smart not to resist. Sam, hand it over. He ordered, and the portly assistant responded instantly, showing just who his loyalties lied with. It was only made worse when he revealed that his motives were something as pedestrian as fame or fortune, something he'd never get now that he dealt with criminals. Instead, the only reward he got was an arm full of red-hot karma courtesy of Wolfram's pistol. And the masked villain would have finished the job too if David hadn't jumped in and taken the second bullet for his former colleague. 
Seeing this, Melissa couldn't keep her emotions in check any longer and tried to run in and help only to get pistol whipped by the villain. By this point, Deku's blood was boiling, his restraints straining to keep him where he was. Not that Wolfram noticed, of course, like many villains before him and many after he was doing the time-honored tradition of monologuing. In the end, it doesn't matter whether we were acting or not. You plan to commit an actual crime, congratulations Mr. Shield. You're one of us now. P please, just stop this. Give him back. Melissa begged with tears in her eyes, but the villain didn't seem to care. Well, he did care about getting rid of loose ends and David's attachment so he aimed the pistol at the downed blonde. An amateurish mistake really. If he had done it I would have done everything in my power to kill that man. David freely admits to the shock of no one. Never underestimate the determination of a man out for revenge. And never piss off the guy who you want to make your high-level weaponry. The Imperium of Man knew this lesson well. Not that our hero of the hour would have allowed him to of course. Deku had broken out of his restraints and was making a beeline to Wolfram only to be blocked by a giant metal wall courtesy of the metal villain. Luckily, Deku had mastered the art of communicating entire sentences with only his face and told Melissa to go save the others while he saved David. Genius, foreign, busty blonde, quirkless, probably rich, can communicate with Deku like that after only a day. Achako muttered, realizing once again how utterly out of her league she was. Thank God Izuku was a complete and utter shonen protagonist when it came to taking hints. Accepting Deku's silent signal Melissa made a run for it and was almost followed by a slightly less random mook only for him to get stopped by Izuku who managed to get in front of him despite Wolfram's attempts to stop him. Izuku did however get pinned down by four pillars of metal soon after. Thankfully the mook was too busy shitting his pants to stop Melissa from making it to the tower's security panel and hacking it back to normal mode in less than a minute allowing the previously restrained heroes to escape and knock out the surprised armed guards. In a single punch, even from a seemingly non-power-typed heroine who looked to just no martial arts. Yeah, those dudes that Izuku smashed into solid metal walls a few minutes earlier were totally dead. But enough about irrelevant mooks, back to the fight between Dollar Store Magneto and Small Might. A Small Might who had just freed himself from the four pillars holding him down and was making his way towards David and the villains by following the injured scientist's blood trail. Here we go boys, girls, and creepy adults. Skeletor, homeless Batman, and the dominatrix took exception to that. We're getting to the good part now, are you all ready to watch little Deku and Dad might beat up some bargain bin villain? Well too bad, we're doing Thiasobi was cut off as several dozen portals opened up in his pocket dimension which immediately raised red flags. Hey Nanny, he exclaimed as several of the space around him warped and shook at the appearance of what had to be several beings of his level or higher. Well, I think it's about time for me to skedaddle. Sorry kids but the fuzz finally found me, later. He said and made a visible effort to move but to no avail. I said later. Ah, uh, crap. He should have guessed it wouldn't be that easy. The Sobai, former member of the council. By the power of your former colleagues, you are hereby under arrest for manipulating mortal timelines, showing mortals worlds beyond their perspective, and most importantly, working with the known interdimensional criminal Rick Sanchez. Oh please, half of those things are barely even crimes. The other gods do the same thing all the time, the only difference is that I don't bother with the formalities and that I refuse to use their stupid astral projection crap. I mean sure he called in a few favors from Rick but so did every other god who got in over their head or was just too lazy to do dimension hops themselves. His captors slapped him across the face for being interrupted. You didn't let me finish. And your crimes committed during the last ZK class scenario in universe 343. How do you plead? She finished, smirking in a Sobai's wide-eyed look of realization as his face paled. You'll never catch me alive, copper. Yes, that was her actual name. You were those stick in the muds on the council. I'll come back, stronger than ever. And with thousands of pranks on standby, I so swear on my many names. The Inquisitors holding him down smirked and the Satsuki impersonator decided to call him out on it. You look pretty caught to me. How do you plan to prank us all again while you're stuck in Dimension Zero? She taunts, a shiver coming down her spine when she noticed the smirk on Asobai's face. That could only mean trouble. Since when were you under the illusion that I was ever here? Renegade for life bitch. And just like that, the body that was caught exploded into purple smoke which knocked out anyone who wasn't prepared for it including the junior inquisitors and the mortal watchers. Seconds later, Copper's perspective. <laughs> Shit, the chief inquisitor cursed, she was getting demoted for this she just knew. Sigh, I'll deal with that bastard later, right now I have to wake up the rookies. It's about time to take these mortals back to where they belong. After doing just that the rookies asked their superior what they should do with the former watchers. They knew too much, administer class C amnestics, I'd make it A, but at this point that probably wouldn't get rid of everything they learned either. At least this way we can erase the existence of that bastard from their memory and get these mortals back to a somewhat normal life. Memory erasure was tricky like that, even more so when you were dealing with the work of someone like a Sobai. The snake always had some kind of contingency plan in the background. They could only hope that they could find him before he could make good on his threats. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Deku reacted to MHA I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. 
A big shout out to Alpha6321 for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Deku Fanfic for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.